Greetings, mortals. I'm Key, and I must apologize for the scraggly voice. I've been sick for the past couple weeks or so. This video was also supposed to come up much sooner after my first, but with any luck, my next few hopefully won't take that long to make. This whole YouTube thing is still a bit new to me, and I'm trying to figure out what kind of content I want on my channel. But enough chatter! Today, I want to talk about what house rules I use to spice up my D&D games. Starting with my personal favorite. This house rule is all about how I do inspiration. But first, I'll need to explain how I give inspiration to my players. Essentially, whenever they get a critical success, they gain a point. And whenever they fail, they lose one. This makes it not only easy to remember, but it encourages them to actually use the thing, instead of holding on to it because you never know when you'll crit fail next. The only die roll that doesn't count towards this is initiative, since that's only for turn order. Now, for the meat of the house rule. The players don't hold the initiative themselves. Rather, when a player crits, it gets added to a pool. An inspiration pool, if you will. And critical fails take away from the pool. What this means is that any player can draw from the pool at any time before they make a roll. The only catch is that every player must agree in order to do so. What this does for my games is promote teamwork, and when someone crits, it feels like the whole party crits. So if one player at the table is having a lucky streak and is critting left and right, no one needs to feel jealous or annoyed, right? Some might say that the flanking mechanic might be a bit overpowered, and though I don't really agree, I do think it's a little bare bones to just swarm an enemy and then hit it till it dies and then move on to the next enemy and repeat. So I use the blind spot rule. In order to gain advantage on an enemy in melee range, you need to attack it from its blind spot, which you can only do if it's already engaged with another target. An exception would be if you were to attack from stealth or with surprise. Now 90% of the time, the blind spot will be directly behind the target, since most creatures have eyes on the front of their head. But, this allows for some creativity on how monsters use their senses. Hydras have multiple heads, so it might not have a blind spot as long as it has more than one active head. Purple worms have tremor sense, so it might not have a blind spot. But, then if you were to attack while flying, then maybe it does. You get the idea. It's essentially the same rule just requiring a bit more strategic positioning. Just bear in mind, the monsters can use it too. Final note, I usually rule that only one creature can benefit from the blind spot at one time. If the creature decides to switch targets on its turn, then the blind spot will obviously move as well. Although, you could rule that creatures with bigger sizes have bigger hitboxes, so to speak, and have bigger blind spots as a result. Imagine your friend's paladin who saved you countless times during fights in the past and has stuck with you and your party through hell and back has just taken a gigaton's worth of damage from an unlucky blow. As he reaches zero hit points, he drops to one knee, but does not fall. Instead, he stares the dragon down, eye to eye, and taunts it. And in doing so, he has bought his friends some valuable time. What I just described is the scenario where my last stand rule takes place. When the PC goes down for the first time in combat, they can make a con save. Now the DC can be as high or as low as you want, though I keep it fairly high at an 18 or higher. If it's too easy, it will happen too often, and therefore won't be as epic. Plus, it might make encounters a bit easier than you intended. If they succeed the save, they don't gain any hit points back, and they're even still rolling for death saves. But instead of being unconscious, and therefore helpless, they're what I call semi-conscious, or having a saving Private Ryan moment. The player can still do things, though their actions are limited. For one thing, they cannot use main actions only bonus actions and reactions. 
They can only move five feet, and they count as being prone. The adrenaline rush is keeping them alive, if only for a moment. You might think this one is a bit too strong, and in some edge cases where the player can heal through a bonus action, maybe it is. But remember, if the character just took a lethal blow and they're still moving around, the enemy is just going to attack them again, and again and again and again, until the moving stops. So the player can very quickly get themselves killed if they're not smart. Sometimes it might just be best to play dead. This is a simple one. Attunement slots are tied to your proficiency score. This means that the players will be able to tune to more magic items at one time, the higher level they are. I always thought it was strange how the number of attunements your character has never changes. If you think this one's a bit too strong in later levels, bear in mind, you can always just make some items require more than one attunement slot to use. Maybe even as much as three. That way, the player will need to pick between having lots of decent items, or having one or two really good ones. Now, this is more for convenience than anything else. I organize how much it costs to stay somewhere based on the current location and economic value. For example, if the players come across a village, it's late, and they want to stay here instead of spending camping supplies, I'll look at my notes and think, hmm, probably five silver for a night here. And I have a little reference table of what kind of place my players could stay in, and how expensive that might be. How well off the land is will also be a factor. Is the economy booming? It'll probably be a little bit cheaper. If the land is suffering a war right now, then it'll probably be a bit more expensive. For even more convenience, when you stay somewhere with a staying fee, regardless of the quality, I also rule that rations get restocked, up to 10. This way of doing things has saved me some game time when it came to traveling long distances. Another simple change, less races have dark vision. Because seeing in the dark is a weirdly common ability amongst D&D races, for some reason. An example of races I allow to keep their dark vision would be Tieflings, due to their devil blood, Drow and Duogar, since they've spent their whole lives in the Underdark, and Tabaxi, since cats can see in the dark pretty good. Why limit the player's dark vision? I just wanted to be a more unique ability, that's all. Potions are useful, aren't they? Health potions are practically mandatory for most adventuring groups just to stay alive. But you know what's not very fun? Having to spend your whole turn drinking them and then doing nothing else. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but the more combatants there are in the fight, the longer it takes to get back to your turn, and for you to do your cool stuff. So, I rule that drinking a potion requires a bonus action, unless the potion states otherwise. Now, this is just my experience, but in the past, I've given players cool potions that I made, only for them to never get used because just attacking is nearly always a better use of their turn. Does this seem like too much of a buff for the players? It might be, though I haven't noticed a significant change in my games. But, if the players can use potions as a bonus action, then the enemies can too. So, there's always that. So I blatantly stole this one from XP to level 3, but for good reason. It makes your intelligent characters feel a bit more... intelligent? If you don't know what I'm talking about, you gain a bonus skill, tool, and instrument proficiency equal to your intelligence mod. Personally, I feel like tools get very little use for how useful they can be, with the exception of maybe... thieves' tools. With any luck, this might encourage your players to pick one up. If you use Terrain Map for combat, or some kind of tabletop software, then this rule might interest you. If you haven't tried it yet, I'd recommend playing without a grid. 
Instead of measuring distance in squares, you use a ruler for attacks and placement. Less of a house rule and more of a playstyle, I guess. The benefits of playing this way is that the game feels a bit less... gamey, for lack of a better word. Assuming you're playing 5th edition, which measures everything in feet anyway, not squares, this is actually a lot easier to implement than it sounds. Another benefit is that areas of effect, like cones, are more accurate than they would be using squares. On the topic of area of effects, I rule that as long as half the creature is in the area, it counts as being fully within it. But you can mix that up. Maybe they make the save with advantage. This is a niche rule that probably won't come into play until your players start to gain a few levels. I use it for my games for a particular reason. To make long rest feel a bit more interesting, you gain back extra hit die if you meet certain criteria. Such as, having a source of heat and light, like a campfire, eating cooked food, or at least higher quality food in a ration, sleeping comfortably, like using a bed or a bedroll, and having some form of shelter, like a tent or a cave. For each criteria you meet, you gain back one extra hit die, in addition to what having a long rest gives. Now I should probably mention that some magic items I make from scratch require a cost of a hit die to use making this house rule a bit more relevant. But even if that's not the case in your game, if you use any survival elements, this one's worth thinking about. So it only just dawned on me, writing this script, there aren't actually that many monsters that cause fear effects. Sure, they can all attempt to intimidate, like players can, but when was the last time your DM did that? I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. It makes sense that monsters' actions that take away the play agency are rare. After all, it's not very fun when your turn is taken away, like being stunned for a round, just because you failed a single saving throw. This house rule should make things a little more interesting though. When subjugated to a fear effect, the player rolls a d12. If the result is 12, 11 or 10, the creature cannot move closer to the source of its fear. You'll have to negotiate with your DM on what counts as moving closer, or not, in the moment. If the result is 9, 8, or 7, the creature must move away from the source of its fear at least 30 feet, if possible. Within reason, of course. Obviously your player is not going to run off a cliff. Unless you want to be a really mean DM. If the result is 6, 5, or 4, the creature must move directly towards the source of its fear, and attack it, if possible. This is the most interesting outcome, as this could actually be a good thing in some cases, or a death sentence in others. Depends on what kind of playstyle your character has. And lastly, if the result is 3, 2, or 1, the creature's movement speed is 0, while the source of its fear is within line of sight. Just to remind those of you who, like me, don't see fear being used all that often. The vanilla rule for being frightened, which is actually what the condition is called by the way, is that the creature has disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls while the source of its fear is within line of sight, and it cannot willingly move closer to it. It's up to you if you want to use that vanilla rule on top of my house rule or not. Perhaps you can mix it up for player characters over non-player characters. For me personally, a frightened creature has disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls, unless it ends up being the 6-4 result, where the creature abandons all reason and does everything in its power to kill the scary target. Kind of like when a spider runs across your desk and you instinctively smack it away with your mouse pad without thinking. And then you feel bad afterwards. And that's it, for the most part at least. There are some other things I do to spice up my games, but honestly, they would be better off explained in their own video. Perhaps I'll do a part 2 in future. Regardless, you can expect some more D&D content soon, and I may also dip into some media talk as well. With that being said, thanks for watching. Be gone. Essentially, whenever they get a critical success, they gain a, a critical, critical success. 
Regardless, you can expect some more D&D &D content soon, and I may also dip some... Um, in the, 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 the.